It's just about the smallest car you can buy. It doesn't come in a kit. It's a smart car, more correctly, the Smart 4-2. Let's drive this 2011 4-2 Passion Cabriolet. Figure out if it even makes sense here and check the tech. The 4-2 was introduced in the U.S. with much fanfare in 2008. Sales were a brisk 24,000 that first year, before they pretty much fell off a cliff, down to less than 6,000 in 2010. For some, it's just too little car. For others, it's just too little sophistication. Now, the first question I get about a Smart 4-2 is, how do you fit in the thing? Really easily, to be honest, this car has gobs of headroom and legroom. Not so good this way. I mean, your door is right up against you and the seats are very close together. That's how they've made the packaging work. But this is not a small car inside this direction or this direction. Now, let's go to the console, such as it is. Here's the base radio, and it's a radio. AM, FM, that's it. But even this base rig has a media button, which brings you this area here, aux and USB. They hide in here in the glove box over there on the, uh, on the side wall of it. A little inconvenient, but fine, considering it's the base radio. Now, we've got this little gear shift right here, which is the only one you're gonna find. Looks like an automatic, P-R-N-D, but it actually goes to an automated manual transmission. We'll talk about more in a minute. That's the most controversial thing about this car, except for its size. Here's the key, very Saab-like, right here by the shifter. Real bad idea, because you're gonna shift this guy a lot, and every time you go for it, you're kind of dragging your hand here, and I know I'm gonna snap that key off in the slot just a matter of time now the real crowd pleaser on this guy is that it's a cabrio and that means it's not like any other open top car you've driven here's the button down here by the shifter open it up and right off the top you get this kind of Renault du chevaux thing where this top slides back in an accordion pleat and it goes back to position number one all the way open big hole over your head side rails here but not very intrusive if you really want to go topless hit the button again and let's head all the way down. It folds the glass rear panel down, exposes a little bit of a uh, roll bar there, and then you've got these latches. You hit this, and you kind of pick these guys up, and they actually come up and out. Now, you've got a real open car. Kind of cool. The coolest way to tech up your 4.2 is to get the smart app for your iPhone and the dock that goes with it. It integrates your iPhone for hands-free calling, iPod music playback, web radio streaming, and a simple where am I map function. Soon it will get an upgrade to have turn-by-turn -turn navigation, and hopefully that same upgrade will also expand applicability. Currently limited to iPhone 3GS running iOS 3. Now look, this is the official car of the you're either one of us or not set. You either get this car or you don't. It's super small. That's one of the first things everyone notices about it, obviously. But it's also a very interesting piece of packaging. It's got a rather high roof line, a relatively high belt line, but with the high roof, it doesn't look like it's one of those slammed bunker style cabins. And of course, one of the other visual cues on this guy is this whole line here with this silver thing, which is part of that, uh, what do they call it, the Tridion safety cell. And this car is like a little bank vault on wheels, the way it's been engineered. Another key visual thing here is the tires mark the perimeter of the car. There's very little ahead of the tread edges, and that's also very unusual. Okay, and what power is something like this? All 1,850 pounds of it. I mean, the seats in an S-Class weigh more than that. Here's the mill. Inline three. Three. One liter. That's it. Made by Mitsubishi. Pretty basic little engine, just a fuel-injected gas engine sitting side saddle here on the axis of the output shaft to the wheels. The numbers on it are interesting. 70 horsepower, 68 foot-pounds of torque. 0 to 60 in 12.8 seconds. They could just as soon say 0 to 60, yes. And the mileage is your payoff. 33 city, 41 highway, with a true high 30s in real world driving. That's why you get a 4.2. Well, that and parking kind of funny. What attaches to this is where this car gets real hard to live with. Over here is this automated manual gearbox. 
the most wrangly, janky piece of gear changing you're ever going to see in a car made since 1950. Let's go for a ride. I'll show you what I mean. Now, the main thing you're aware of here is you have to learn to drive this car. You don't just step on the gas and get all the power you need. You'll get in trouble doing that. The transmission, how can I describe this, is a very inexpensive automated manual. There is probably no worse a combination of attributes in the automotive industry. It feels like you've got a little capuchin monkey in there who's driving a manual gearbox for you, and he's not very good at it. So long lags between clutch, if you will, gear change, re-engagement of clutch, and application of power. It's a lazy man's gearbox, as if it's being shifted by a lazy man. So what you do to get around this is one of two things. If you're in drive, you've got to feather the throttle. You can overwhelm that gearbox like that by stomping on it. Then it really balks and it falls on its face as it goes from gear to no gear. When you're in the manual mode, you can do better. You can hold the revs longer and not get caught flat-footed, but I'm sure it takes a toll on the gas mileage. The key thing is, if you leave it in drive, ease into your power inputs. Don't overwhelm the gearbox. That's the best you're going to get out of this guy. And you're still going to get really long, lazy shifts, especially 1, 2, and 2, 3. Now, Mercedes has just announced right around this time that we're shooting, early February, that they are taking over the distribution and sales from Roger Penske's organization. So, and this is a Daimler product, or a Daimler-related product, by the way. So that could mean that Mercedes is getting serious about re-attacking the U.S. market, and they know the gearbox is a problem. There may be something new in the pipeline. I hope it's not some slippery, sloppy CVT. I would love a manual in this thing, but I don't know why. I guess for uh, fuel economy reasons, that might not work out. I've always wanted to try this. Let's see if you can really back one of these into a parking spot and not be sticking way the hell out. Okay, how's that? Look pretty good? Hmm, not bad, it works. <laughs> it's kind of fun. Okay, let's price a Smart 4.2 Passion. Passion's the higher trim model. It's not totally bare bones, has things like power windows and some nicer stuff on the interior. 15.4, that's for the hard top. Now to go Cabriolet, add $3,000. It's a big up on a car this cheap, but it's really a pretty impressive top mechanism. The CNET textile options include the Highline radio with touchscreen and navigation. 1300, I'm dubious on that one for some reason. I'm more intrigued by the surround sound premium audio with all the additional speakers for a mere 490. A few hundred bucks here and there for things like cruise control, 120 for those little gauges on the top. That's really a cheap option. The most expensive additional thing on this car is about $20,000, $22,000. That's for a small car with a decent transmission. 